right, I want to share two different uh, videos today. And so the first one, I just want to get this out of the way. It's really short. It's from God Tunes. And I want you to notice here it says, We will be showing godly and uplifting quotes from our previous episodes. Quote. I will. Hold, let me. Hold on. Hold on. Let me let this play out here. And then I'm going to read it. Okay. Quote. I was with Jesus. I was an apostle. I preached the gospel. But yet I was destroyed and ended in hell. You go to church, fast, and pray, but that will not guarantee you heaven. Boy, is that uplifting or what? Oh, feels so good after reading that. Huh, don't you? Just feel so fuzzy, warm inside. I mean, that's just... Whew, boy, that feels good to read that. Doesn't it? Not That will not guarantee you heaven. Oh, ha ha. You know what? That feels good if you're the enemy. It feels good... Reading a quote from something that suggests Christians aren't guaranteed heaven. Ha ha ha. You're not going to heaven, you bozo. Well, I mean, there. I don't know if any other way to look at this. This is not uplifting. It's not peaceful at all. This only brings torment. You're not guaranteed heaven. Uh, no matter what, you're not guaranteed heaven. No matter what. There's no possible way to have peace if you're not given that guarantee of everlasting life. Okay, so that's enough. I mean, this they should change the name from God Tunes to Looney Tunes. I mean that. Okay, so I want to take a look at some other clowns. Some other cartoon character Looney Tunes. And there's this guy here, what changed my mind. Uh, you know what? I think we ought to look at him. And this guy is on the attack. This guy is going at it. Now let's listen to what he has to say. Let's be fair about this. I used to believe in once saved, always saved. You might ask, what changed my mind about it? It, it? Here's what changed my mind. It was actually reading the Bible that changed my mind. As I read the Bible, I could no longer believe in it and adhere to it. Now, you might say to me, well, those who believe in one saved, always saved. They also read the Bible, and they get that teaching from the Bible. No, the problem is they're reading the Bible the wrong way. You see, there's two ways to read your Bible. You can read it the right way or the wrong way. <laughs> That seems rather obvious, isn't it? But the right way is what is called yeah. inductive reading. Inductive reading means I let actually the scriptures themselves create my belief. In other words, when I read it, then I believe it. I don't believe it first and then read it. I I don't believe it first, then read it. In other words, he doesn't believe it, and then he reads it. In other words, he doesn't have any faith when he reads it. Therefore, he has the veil over his heart when he reads it. You get that? I mean, if you watch this entire video, it's just a bunch of nonsense. But if you consider what he's saying, that's exactly what he's saying. That he doesn't believe it when he reads it. I believe means I let actually the scriptures themselves create my belief. In other words, when I read it, then I believe it. I don't believe it first and then read it. I don't believe it first and then read it. I don't believe what I'm reading and then I read it. 
and then I decide what I want to believe. Okay, this is all vain philosophy, all right? I get that, but just on the what he's saying, based on what he's saying, he's saying he does not believe it when he reads it. All right, and in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 15, I think this is so important because it shows that without faith, you can't have a true understanding of the scripture because there's a veil upon your heart. If you don't have faith, how are you going to have understanding? The scripture, the, the secrets, if you will, is for those that have faith okay second Corinthians 3 verse 15 but even under this day when Moses is read the veil is upon their heart nevertheless when it shall turn to the Lord the veil shall be taken away all right and so <clears throat> just like what we read but their minds are blinded for until this day remains the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Okay. Now, um, so this guy here, let's listen a little more. I believe it as it comes to me. So I'm letting the Bible create my belief system. The opposite is what is called deductive Bible reading. That means I start off with a belief. Then I try to read the Bible with my colored glasses, with my belief, so that I'm trying to find Bible passages to prove what I already believe. That's called deductive Bible re reading. And I realized that's what I was doing. You see, we get belief. Okay, so, all right. So the argument that he's making is that if you start out with the worldview, what I like to call worldview, and when you read the Bible, you what you're reading is going is going to fit into your worldview. Now, in a sense, that's true. I mean, it is true. The problem is everybody has a worldview. If you have a brain, you have a worldview. Right, now your worldview could very well be wrong, but you got a worldview, a way that you view the world, a belief. Now this guy is to prove what I already believe. That's called deductive Bible re reading, and I realized that's what I was doing. You see, we get beliefs before we read the Bible often. So he's making the claim that he has no belief at all in anything which is not true. That's that's his argument. He doesn't believe in anything at all or what I say, what I call a worldview. He doesn't have any worldview at all. But what he's saying is that he don't have he doesn't have any belief at all. Even from tradition. The tradition could be a religion, a denomination, or in my case, my pastor said once saved, always saved. So I believed it. And so I would read the Bible and, and I would read the Bible with my once saved, always saved glasses. So I would read, let's say, John chapter 15, verse 2, where Jesus said, John 15, verse 2. All right, let's go to that real quick because you're going to notice he does not read from a true Bible every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit the father cuts off and throws it okay so <clears throat> if you're familiar with John 15 I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except <clears throat> it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. All right, and so his the commandment is to love one another as I have loved you, or as he has loved us. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, and Jesus Christ has done exactly that. He has laid down his life for us, okay? Now, this is very simple, and it seems to me that a lot of people that, you know, obviously reject the gospel of Jesus Christ don't understand that the uh, branch, uh, the branches and the bearing the fruit is about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are bearing, or you are, um, you are fruitful, you are preach, when you preach the gospel, you are uh, planting seeds of the fruit. The fruit is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's if you don't have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have fruit. You're not being fruitful. You're not. Uh, you're, not you're a dead branch. You're going to be cut off. I mean, it's really not that complicated. Now, what happens is when you have a worldview, in my opinion, if you have a worldview that, well, your fruit is going outside and walking an old lady across the street, all right, or, you know, donating a uh, hundred bucks to some cancer uh, research, you know, good works, doing good things. That's how you be, or giving, you know, 10% of your paycheck to Pastor Smitty. Uh, that's good works. That's bearing fruit. I mean, that, that's what they think. That's the way I perceive they think it because of the way they talk about it. Bearing fruit, being fruitful, is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you believe in yourself, that's the opposite. Right? That's the opposite of believing in in the Lord Jesus Christ and if you now Jesus here is saying if you believe in me you abide in me and I abide in you now imagine this Jesus Christ abides in you and you know Jesus Christ never dies and if he's in you there's no way he's gonna come out of you Right? There's just no way. He never dies. If he never dies, you never die. When you are born 
of the Spirit of God, which is Jesus Christ. You have everlasting life. And he abides in you, and you abide in him. Now, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ has done it all to save you, then you don't have faith in him at all. And think about this down here where he says, No greater love or greater love has no man than this that a man laid down his life for his friends and what has Jesus done for us he laid down his life for us that so that we might have life everlasting life now if you don't believe in what he done if you believe what you are doing makes you a good person you don't believe what he has done for you at all you don't believe in Jesus Christ at all if you think you're a good person if you think you have to repent of sin to be saved you're not saved at all it's what he has done that can save us it's not what we do that can save us we can't save ourselves in fact I mean and just in my experience alone I know I realized I can't do it I can't save myself. I'm destined for hell. I got no chance. I got no chance at all. My only chance is Jesus Christ. It's my only hope. I can't do it myself. And so I think that's where uh, folks like this guy is at. And just looking at his yard here is that a I don't know what that is I'm too poor to know what that is is that like some sort of oven that's a countertop he's got a nice wall what does he got a fireplace right there nice seating oh, that's beautiful right there I'm telling you, he's got the sidewalk and the lights I bet you that's something at nighttime probably warm weather uh, all year round so he can do it he appears to me to be very successful all right now I, I shouldn't judge him based on appearance but you know sometimes it's good to be poor sometimes it's good to step away from the world and to take an overview of the world that we all live in and know that this world is wicked it's full of corruption and this world is on a fast track to destruction this world cannot and will not sustain itself and that's why I say it's good to take a step back it's better to be poor than it is to be rich because when you're rich you're so involved in the world you don't see it for what it is you don't see the evilness and the wickedness and the corruption all around you because you're part of it you're so wrapped up in your daily life you're not able to take a step back and see the overview of how wicked this life is and I think we can uh, use a lot of Bible verses to 
support this. Uh, Luke 14, verse 26. If any man come to me <clears throat> and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yeah, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now think about that. That's incredible, isn't it? I mean, for me, when I was uh, just learning this stuff, when I read this for the first time, I was blown away. Because this kind of wisdom does not come from the world. This only comes from God. And for you to understand it, can only come from God. John 12, verse 25. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, uh, what does this mean? Well, if I think that if you're saved, I think you do know what this means. Now, I can share my thoughts with you. But I have confidence that those of us that are saved knows what this means. That our life is full of sin. Our life is full of misery. Our life is just full of all kinds of wickedness. If I go back and take a whole look at my life and I, I see all the destruction I've done, I'm disgusted with myself. And <laughs> It's terrible what I've done. The things that I've done in my life, it's just terrible. And where is this life going to? You know, in this flesh, I'm going to die. So why, why, why would I love this life knowing that there's an end? And there's death, and there's sin, and there's misery, and there's sorrow, destruction. No. No. This life is no good. The only life that is good is eternal life that Jesus Christ has promised us. And that is the life to come, what we put our hope into. And in Revelation 21, it talks about God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now this is when... Uh, we are resurrected, right? So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we that are saved are lifted up. First the dead in Christ, and then those of us which are alive and remain are lifted up with them to meet the Lord in the air at the last trump. And then our enemy is gathered at our feet. It is They are destroyed forever. It is destroyed forever. And then we come back down on earth in the holy city, the new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. And this is where we have uh, our glorified bodies, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more death, and no more pain. This is the life that we look forward to. The life that we live here is coming to an end, but those of us that have eternal life have life that lasts forever. And therefore the second death has no power over us, just as we read here in Revelation 20. In the second death, uh, where's this at? 
right there. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On such, the second death has no power. Right now, we are priests of God and of Christ. And we reign with Christ for a period of time, which will come to an end when he comes in the clouds of heaven at the last trump. Just like what we read in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And all through, I mean, there's numerous five. That's not the only places. It's all throughout the Bible. All the way from the beginning to the end. All right. So, I just wanted to share my thoughts with you. Uh, you know, these guys like Tom Brown, <laughs> it's obvious. They're not saved. And their whole mission in life is to get people that are saved to doubt their eternal security and to discourage those that are not saved from ever believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. If they think you, they can guilt people into being a good person, and if you guilt them into being a good person, and you get then their focus is not on the Lord Jesus Christ but on themselves and you're not gonna win that battle because you're not a good person think about what Jesus says I mean in Mark uh, <laughs> I mean do I even have to quote this stuff I think you guys already know it Jesus said unto him why callest thou me good there is none good but one that is God only God is good now to finish this off to close this here in Mark 18 and in uh, Matthew 19 it's interesting yeah well I'm sorry in Luke 18 it's interesting that Jesus is saying I'm not good or I'm he's not saying I'm not good He's not saying, hey, I'm not good. Uh, you're wrong. No. He's just pointing out the fact that there is none good but one, and that is God. So when the guy called him good, he was right. But he should understand that the reason Jesus is good is because he is God. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now consider this. Once saved always saved is the gospel of Jesus Christ without it it is impossible to have peace it's impossible John 14 peace I leave with you my peace I give unto you not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid.